Hey everybody, this is Carlos. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with Diem Bubade of Celestial Exotics. Diem is a top-notch boa breeder known for his work with pastel boas. We're going to talk about how he got involved in the boa game and his plans for the upcoming season. Finally, we're going to talk about the importance of being resilient when facing setbacks in your collection. Boa Rack Radio is on the air now. Welcome everybody to Boa Rack Radio. I'm your host, Carlos Rojas of Morse Unleashed, and with me is my co-host, Tom Cobb of Boa Addicts. What's up, Tom? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, man. So today we have one of your favorite humans on the planet here uh, on our show, and uh, our guest today is Diem Budabe of Celestial Exotics. Uh, based out of Washington, Diem is well-known for his cutting-edge work with pastel boas, but he's also well-known in the boa world for his ability to help out new customers, uh, newcomers, and basically anybody who is looking for assistance, even when the bigger breeders will tend to blow them off. Diem is really, really resilient, and that's one of the main things that we're going to cover on today's show. Diem, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, my pleasure. So, Dan, why don't you give us your background a little bit, how you got involved with reptiles and eventually how that led to you getting involved with with uh, boas? Uh, Well, I would say that my love for boas began with a general love of animals. Um, I grew up in southern Louisiana, out in the sticks. Uh, every day I went out, you know, into the woods or went out to the bayous and most days I would try to convince my mom to let me bring some kind of creepy crawly or furry thing that I found in the woods in the house, but <laughs> in most cases it was no. Uh, my uh, The possibility of me getting a snake as a kid went out the window when my brothers had a rat snake that got out and my mom found it in the house. Uh, at that point, everybody was banned from having any type of anything with scales, period. It didn't matter what it was, mom was not playing that game. So, I mean, I was I was the typical feral, barefoot, mud-covered kid running around in, in, you know, the wilderness every day. That's awesome. So yeah, how, how'd much you get... has changed. Yeah. So <laughs> how'd you really... get into boas? Uh, that's a bit of a funny story because I never had any intention of getting into boas. I actually wanted to get into ball pythons. Oh, really? Yeah, I know. It's gross, right? No, I'm just kidding. Ball pythons are fine. Yeah. Um, (laughs) one day I had gone to a pet store, um, in New Mexico with the intention that I was going to get a boa constrictor. I actually was uh, more interested in getting into ball pythons than I was boas at the time. And that was mostly just because a friend of mine had one when I was a kid and I'd always wanted one. I really didn't know anything about morphs, how big breeding them was or anything like that. But I'd gone to a pet store to get a ball python that day when I lived in New Mexico and they were actually out of ball pythons and for some reason in my head it didn't seem that much different to get a ball python versus a boa so I decided that I was going to go ahead and get the boa I had no idea how to care for it I didn't know (laughs) anything about it other than it wasn't a python I took it home yeah any any snake is better than no snake right right and that was kind of the mentality which is You know, why I always laugh when people are like, you know, oh, you shouldn't have bought it if you didn't know anything about it. I mean, yeah, and in principle, obviously, that's a really good um, suggestion to follow. But the reality of it is not everybody's going to do that. And few people probably will, even if they become people who are fully capable of taking care of those animals or, you know, speaking about those animals once they do their research and they learn from their experiences. Uh, luckily, my experience wasn't negative at all. I found some forums back in the day. Uh, Reptazone was one of them. Oh, my God. That I is old school. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if that forum's still no, around. But I, I was, think it went away like 10 years ago. <laughs> I was lingering around on that one for a while, and then I found redtailboa.net, redtailboas.com, Reptile Insider, uh, Fauna Classifieds, all the late, great forums of the day. And, and, and we actually I, met on the on those forums like way back when and on Redtail I, I think it was yeah Redtail and I remember the, like a lot of people don't realize this was in 2012 when DM and I first met is when I got back into the hobby uh, like morph wise and stuff and DM called me out on the forum and pretty <laughs> much had had this perception of like oh shit here comes a new guy it's gonna be the same old humdrum of like. Coming in I hard, figured you were a quick burn. burner. 
yeah, yeah cool. you know uh just just how you get burned out you know and and you're not wrought with this success because i guess you know especially in the beginning that was kind of the perception i i gave off was like oh i'm gonna go hard and you know we know when most people go hard they have a tendency to burn out yeah kind of totally 90 percent of the time yeah and that's something we'll probably talk about a little bit later with dm but yeah sorry dm i just i remembered that and and you know it was a fond moment for me too because even back then we're talking eight years ago almost to the day um dm was in essence policing the hobby to a degree and right. it has stayed consistent through I mean, eight years to now, you know, I, I've known DM for eight years and uh, Man, that level of, yeah, the, well, the level of like teaching and mentorship and DM's ability to kind of portray in a serious yet semi nice tone. Like you need to be serious when you're talking serious matters. Literally from the first time that I met DM to now, it has not changed. So, you know, exactly. Oh, who you're totally, getting. totally. Legit. <laughs> hundred percent. And I know that's always been like the two people that when I think, think of just policing the forms and policing the hobby, like DM and Slavic's name kind of popped to mind, you know, that's like the two main people that have always kind of done that. Well, um, it's actually interesting you guys bring that up because that's, um, relative to who my initials mentors was, uh, were actually, but, um, We'll obviously get to that, I think, later. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The, um, the boa, her name was Artemis, and she was, by my standards, not a nice looking normal at all. But I loved her. I, I didn't know any other way than that at the time, anyhow. But I soon got that craving, you know, that everybody gets <laughs> once they get the first one. And then, of course, um, I came across a website, and you know, it might have actually been salmonboa.com, where there was the Scoria boa. Right, yeah. And I saw that, and I was blown away by it. I'm still blown away by them, even when I can, you know, open up an enclosure and see one in person, I'm still blown away by this mutation. And <laughs> I had it in my mind, and this is back in like 2006 i was thinking yeah i'm definitely gonna have one of those one day i had no idea about a lot of the rumors that have been going on around them real or otherwise or price points or anything like that i just decided that's what i wanted so i started looking into morphs and mutations and then i came across uh call albino and decided i wanted to work with that and uh, purchased my first, uh, well, it would have been my second BOA, which was a Call Albino. I don't remember what the price point was at the time. It was considerably more than it is now, obviously. But uh, his name was Helios, and so I had Artemis and Helios, and then um, I learned about Moon Glows, and so I picked up some Triple Hit Moon Glows and some Double Hit Snows and, and things like that. And, you know, my whole goal was, I want to make Moon Glows. I want to make Snows. Again, you know, wasn't even considering... <clears throat> the financial component of it, it was the fact that they were out of my price range as visuals and I could just make them and, and you know, it would take me a few years, but it's possible. Funny story, to this day, despite having five or six breedings where it should have resulted in snows or moon glows, I got every possible combination except for the snows and moon glows. <laughs> so still have not pr uh, produced one <laughs> to oh, this man. day. Oh, man. Um, but that, you know, I started giving them all mythological names and um, things that were relative to, like, Greek mythology or Roman mythology or Egyptian, a lot of polytheistic stuff. Right. And then that's when I came up with the name Celestial Exotics. Oh, okay. I gotcha. Yeah. So that's where that came from. Oh, that's pretty cool, um, actually. But within within two years, I was I was on my way to having some pairings within, you know, another two years or so. I ended up buying out the rest of Sean Moreland's collection in um, Georgia to kind of boost my uh, call projects that I had going on at the time. And I had also gotten some caging from him to expand. Um, by the end of, I want to say it was... 2000 and 
11, I had had a f my first couple of litters, but they were just, um, I, <laughs> I, I didn't really know that making hets and things like that at the time, uh, was not going to necessarily be the best way to go about doing the breedings and making pos hats actually is what I oh, ended wow. up doing okay. a lot of them. So I ended up wholesaling those to local stores in Florida at the time. And this was before, this was when the reptile of concern permits were needed for, uh, you know, the Burmese and the African rock pythons and right. the green anacondas and all those guys. But this was before the um, addition of them to the Lacey Act. So there were quite a few more pet stores, I would say, in Florida at the time that I lived there than there probably is now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much how I got started. It quickly took off from there. I eventually met... Um, I had three hey. primary... Oh, sorry. What's that? You met me. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not there yet, Tom. That unfortunate day has not sprung up <laughs> this timeline what? yet. <laughs> How dare you? I mark it on my calendar, so I know I, ca I need to cry for a little bit every time it, That's it shows funny. up. But first, let me ask you, what are some things outside of reptiles that you're passionate about? Horses. Actually. Oh, nice. Nice. I've, I've worked with horses off and on for most of my life. It's funny because I'm not very much a kid person, but horses are basically like perpetual toddlers, and yet I oh yeah the they are company. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I like to draw, actually. Um, I do that kind of in my off time, I guess you would say. Right. And uh, I like to play video games sometimes. Okay. Okay. You got any horses right now? No, I do not. I haven't owned horses. For a very very long time yeah but, uh hopefully once the military thing comes to completion and not looking at traveling around every few years that'll be something that i can get into yeah no i i, I feel you completely because you know what the first purchase i made when i got out of the military and kind of settled down in a place permanently it was a horse right so i ended up having uh three horses and they were ginormous uh, all were over 16 hands. One was 18 hands. So they were my gigantic babies, and I had them for quite a few years. And unfortunately, I had to move down to uh, uh, the Phoenix area, which is way too hot for horses, in my opinion. People keep them down there, but oh, they I just... Oh, I I lived in Tucson for a while. Yeah, they just don't enjoy the Phoenix area as much as they enjoyed Flagstaff. So I ended up uh, uh, selling them to a friend of mine uh, who kept them up here in, in northern arizona and they're still alive kicking and enjoying life you know that's fantastic mm -hmm. i used to actually travel around with a troop of jousters to renaissance festivals oh that's awesome yeah and uh i worked with uh draft breeds for the most part uh we had you know clydesdale shires belgians american warm bloods things like that yeah yeah um and one of the horses that they had he made it to i want to say 33 or 34 years old um, and they had another one that was 29 or so. And even at those ages, those guys still want to work. Oh, yeah. No, they're awesome. They, uh, they all of my horses. Put in their time. All of my horses, uh, with the exception of one, because I had three, um, they were uh, Percherons. And those things oh, were. I love and they weren't like the. We had a few of those. And, and the cool thing is these guys were not like the, you know, like the typical Percheron that's like a farm horse. These guys were like active hunting horses. And, you know, they'd go up, they'd hike the mountains with me you know we had them up to like 10 11 thousand feet multiple times they had they were That's really awesome. strong footed and smart like i even treat a bear with one one time because the bear decided to charge me and when you're on an 18 hand horse a bear really doesn't scare an 18 hand horse if he's no, like stable and, i mean percherons <laughs> you're talking about an animal that can and does weigh a literal ton yeah literally yeah, yeah. they uh one of my favorite horses actually his name was doug <laughs> He he was a Percheron. He had a moonlight blindness in his left eye, so okay. he couldn't see yeah. out of his left eye. Yeah. But when they go down the list for the jousting, the left eye is the eye that's facing inward, so it's mm -hmm. facing the other rider and their horse. He can't see, but he trusted his rider so much, he would joust just as well as the rest of them. That's crazy. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
You know what? Uh, funny you bring up jousting. My kids are absolutely obsessed with The Knight's Tale. It was the first time they have seen it, and it's one so of my favorite movies. Like, <laughs> and that's my actually kids a pretty good week. movie overall. I, there's only really like three or four gripes I have about it in regards to jousting. Just cause right. when I jousting was something I was really passionate about for a while, working the Ren Fairs and stuff like that. So you know, similar to Boas, it's no different. I learn everything that I can about it, and <laughs> <laughs> nice, you know. So, but that was a, that was a really, really fun time. I'm glad I got to do that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So let me ask you, let's kind of switch back to the boa thing. Um, what made you go from a hobby collection into more of a breeding collection? I think when I would consider anything that I wanted to do with myself, breeding boas was really the only thing that came to mind. And it wasn't just breeding for the sake of breeding. I had a very specific goal in mind. At that point, it was not snows and moon glows anymore. It was color. It was enhancing the reds and the pinks and the oranges and making the brightest, cleanest animals possible, but also animals that were not only colorful as neonates, but as they got into adulthood, they yes. were still very yes. colorful because there are there are a lot of them. They'll come out in the beginning looking really nice, colorful, and clean, and it's just as they age, they just darken a lot. Yeah, no, I think uh, as one of our former guests put it, and not to shit on ball pythons, but that's the, the ball python factor a lot of times, right? You get these super mind-blowing colors in their youth, and then they just fade out, you know, to yep. a very that, monotone that version. A lot I, of I think... So I think that that's a, you know, a really good realization that people need to come to, and that's why lineage is so important. You want to be able to look through the history on the animals that have been produced that you're inquiring about. Well, let me see mom, let me see dad, let me see the grandparents. Where did they come from? What lineage are we working with? Because then you can see what adult versions have the possibility to give attribute-wise to the younger generations. and. You know, you can see these wonderful animals when they're young, and when they get three years old, you're just sometimes disappointed in the, in the outcome, you know, and it's not really what you want to do, so then you end up getting that, rid of that's it. That's happened because... to me plenty. <laughs> well, yeah. and I th but I, th I think that that's, that's a normal transition, because not every diamond is going to stay a diamond. Like, you're not no. always going to win, you know, but through experience and through examples, you can say, okay, here's an attribute that this one had, this one turned out stellar, well, this one has it as well, the likelihood is higher that it's going to follow that same pathway, right? Well, Whereas like, then we're, you're ta yeah, you're talking about manipulation of polygenic traits. Yes, and, and you know, the, the polygenics, like, it, it's very, and, and this is a topic, you know, that I don't know if we'll touch on today in any extent, but the idea of polygenics, you know, a lot of people have this propensity to be like, oh, well, I mean, arbitrary. I'll, I'll say Ferrari because we're talking with DMK. So I have super nice Ferrari, right? I If I breed it to, let's just say normal, right? This is a technically a normal pastel Ferrari to just a normal boa. You're going to have a range of quality coming out in the offspring. You're Absolutely. That exhibit the traits of Ferrari. And then you're going to have ones where it is quote-unquote Ferrari line. It doesn't actually exhibit the trait or the namesake, right? So you, you can you can look at your your litter and say, okay, well, this one, this one, and this one is a higher likelihood of being a legit Ferrari polygenic as it ages. These ones, they're pretty, but they are not a polygenic. Like, they're not exhibiting that polygenic. The, a pet peeve of mine is when people breed a, a line boa, either, let's say, Ferrari or... Uh, Pink Panther or Red Rum or whatever, and they call every single baby the namesake just because it came from a litter of Ferrari. That's not how polygenics work. You have to absolutely dude. visually see that polygenic taking effect, right? And a lot of people don't even know what polygenic means. It's the idea that you have multiple genes throughout the genome of the animal that are affecting color attributes to the phenotype. So... You know, some are going to have a higher expressivity, others are not, and the ones that don't are going to be on the lower end of the spectrum. You right. Know, and, and so, you know, I think Ferrari was a good example, and we'll, we'll probably get into that a little more because that's one of DM's main projects. Yeah, so. definitely. Definitely. I got I, I to gotta tell you guys, I'm so proud of Tom. He's come such a far, far way. <laughs> and he just, he's yeah. just so good at explaining it now. It's so beautiful. 
I it's know, a thing of I beauty. To, Sorry, it's just a moment to... that I'm having right now. <laughs> I know, it, it, it's, it's like seeing your little brother. Well, no, I guess you're younger than me, so you're my little brother, right? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> the old one. But it's, it's, it's like I'm like, the, I'm like the, the ex-con older brother that finally found <laughs> God or something. <laughs> His coming to was, Jesus moment. DM was always like the choir boy, like, like <laughs> who was always good and always sat up straight, and I was the one always putting my feet on the table. But now I'm sitting up straight, so DM's proud. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, one of the things that uh, we've kind of hit on a couple of times is uh, the topic of mentors, right? So obviously Tom sees himself as somebody who you mentored. Uh, Who are some of the folks that mentored you kind of along the way? So I actually was lucky. I had three primary mentors in the very beginning. And um, the first two I met through redtailboa.net, and that was – Donnie, also known as Uncle Morty Smith. Yep, Donnie Smith, yep. Yep, yep. (laughs) And um, his wife, Michelle. Yeah. Lady Dragon. Yep. And uh, I met them. I was a butthead, as are most 20-year-olds. And I uh, would kind of, you know, in my own trollish way, give him grief on the forums when he was a moderator, but... He, they took me under their wings and, you know, they answered every stupid question that I had. They let me meet them at an expo so they could show me how to probe and how to um, palpate for the hemis and all of those things. You know, they taught me about different mutations. They taught me about, you know, basic genetics and things like that. And they were always available for me if I needed them. And it was, it was always something that I really appreciated from them. Because they wouldn't, they wouldn't hold your hand really, but they'll walk beside you. You know what I mean? Yeah, and no, that's, totally. That's that's ideal mentorship, really. I didn't need somebody to hold my hand. I needed somebody who would tell me, you know, the hard stuff. And they did. They they didn't sugarcoat anything with boas. Not about breeding them. Not about keeping them. And uh, then eventually on fauna, there used to be a chat room back in the day. Yep. And I would go into it, and that's where I met Chris Canada Smith, who is the founder of the Ferrari line. Right. And through Chris, I started learning about the importance of selective breeding, the importance of refining wild type. You know, for instance... You know, somebody has a litter of, you know, normals, hypos, whatever, and there's like a screaming looking hypo from that litter. You're going to want to look at all of the normals and see what the normals look like because the hypo in and of itself can make something look significantly nicer than what its genetic potential is. Right. So you want to look at every single, you want to look at as many of them in the litter as you can. And, and like Tom said before, you want to look at pictures of parents, you want to look at pictures of grandparents, anything you can to get an idea of what this animal's actual genetic potential is. And so I realized, you know, any, pretty much anybody can take some hets and throw them together to make some mutation or gene stack or anything like that. And in some mutations, there's no regards for what the normals look like or or what the base mutations look like in that combination because people want the combination, but they don't realize that the ones that aren't the combination aren't going to be the best looking animals. And so in my experience, a lot of the times you get first, you know, first time hits of a new mutation or whatever, and people slap them together as quickly as they can. And it comes out and you, yay, you have the new mutation as well. But like the rest of the offspring that come with it are kind of meh. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the more you add to it, generally, the more you see that weakness, I would say, in in color and in representation. And so I learned all of that from Chris. And when he got out of the hobby, I actually took on a large portion of his collection and wanted to continue on with his vision, which had become mine. And so one of the litters that I was proudest of making took over 10 years to make. And that's when I ended up putting a Ferrari with a sugar, uh, pastel Mm -hmm. and I made sugar Ferraris and yeah, it was combining two lines, but at the end of the day, I was combining the best example of what a sugar should be. And I bred it to what the best example of what a Ferrari would be. And out of that litter, the majority of the litter 
came out as the as prime examples. There was very very few in that litter that you looked at and you were just like, nah, okay, if any at all, really. Right. Um, well, it's like it's like almost like cooking, right? It's like you could throw together the same two or three ingredients, um, but really the uh, ra- the ratio of each one of those two ingredients is what's going to determine if it's, something's going to be good, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, I totally get it. I totally get it. So let's talk about maybe what your current project focus is. Tell me about some of the stuff, some of the different things that you're currently working with um, and maybe some of the things that you'd like to work with soon. Well, I uh, actually have moved out of a good many number of different projects over the last couple of years to go back to focusing on refining wild types and what we would consider quote-unquote base morphs. So hypo, jungle call albino things like that but my whole goal is the same thing that it was before uh just more zeroed in on the sugars more zeroed in on the ferraris the red rums i'm not spread apart as much anymore i would say but the whole the whole thing that i want to accomplish is cleanest brightest most colorful i i want i want the title of most colorful at some point right yeah, and, and, and the idea is – sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I was just going to say that's really awesome because I think so many people are chasing throwing as many potential genes and just stacking genes and stacking genes and stacking genes that sometimes that uh, – while it does produce really awesome boas sometimes, a lot of times what it does is it mutes the potential – potency of each one of those genes right within it and mm-hmm. i think that's what we've seen like a watering down a lot of times of you know various base morphs so no i think it's absolutely awesome i mean when you get to the point where people are having to ask out of entire litters what's jungle and what's not and it's because the jungle is so lowly expressed that you're you're looking for just one of the six or seven common characteristics that they have and it, it's all from just <laughs> part in the way i say it i guess but breeding junk to junk no absolutely expecting, well, it's, it's, expecting it's, to get something nice out of it it just doesn't work that way well it goes back to the mentality of of a lot of people when it's just produce to produce there's no thought behind the actual production it's just a numbers game they want to produce to produce but when you're putting animals together the idea should be like you shouldn't just have one animal and then polish a turd with that one animal. You want quality to quality because you're going to get quality, right? But I think so many people, and I get it. Like, I, I get the idea. I mean, my page name is Boa Addicts. It's so addicting. Like, it's insane the feeling you get when you produce and when you see these babies born. And when you see copulation or you see successful pairings and breedings, it's like... I mean, you you get almost a high off of it because you're so proud of the fact that it's happening. But if you're just doing it haphazardly and just kind of doing it to do it because you want to feel that high, but then what you're producing is not up to the par of what you could have produced, you're you're jumping the gun and you're rushing ahead of yourself. And that's why we, we've seen it through years and years, dilution of super quality lineages to the point to where almost the namesake doesn't even matter anymore. And and so, that, I don't think, is something that any of us really want to see in the end, you know? No, and I mean, look at... The, I mean, it's to the point now where there's fires being produced that barely look like fires. Right. I, I've, seen, I, I've seen quite a few fires in person, and I've yet to see anybody outdo what Tom has been doing with them as far as them popping out and the color and the cleanliness. But it's crazy to me to see some of them where you can tell it's a fire, but it's an ugly fire. And that's one of those genes where you're like, that shouldn't be able to happen. You shouldn't be able to create ugly fires. Well, I mean, but see the thing with fire is so much of the base fire that has happened has been mixed with so many different, uh, subspecies of boa and then those subspecies based fires because i mean they're already a subspecies in and of itself bred into either colombian or central base 
and then bred from there. Um, you know, they like central boas have a different look or different attribute. And coupled with fire, you get just a, a little bit of a cleaner looking central. Now, to me, obviously, Colombian is my go-to. I mean, and I mean they're all intergrades anyway at this point. But I think with fire, the vast majority of people who were picking up fires were focused on just mass production of fires so that they could do fire to fire and make leucistics because the idea is you can never make enough leucistics. You really couldn't. If you made a thousand leucistics a year, you would sell every single one. So now when you have a white snake, you don't necessarily see the underlying phenotype of that snake behind right. the leucism, right? And so because of that, you don't really know what that leucistic is going to pop out. So my first litter of leucistics, I did from a motley fire to a hypo fire. And I got leucistics in it. And the thing is, they technically could be hypo motley leucistics, but I couldn't know because they just look like leucistics, right? So when I sold them, like, oh, yeah, you could get hypo, you could get motley. I mean, they're allelic. If half your litter is motley and half your litter is hypo when you breed it, that's what that's what that leucistic is going to be. Hey, but, let me ask you something, Tom. And this is something that I've always wondered, uh, especially with, you know, super fires, just because I, I it's not a, a project I chased and it's not a project that I have. Um, but when you're looking at a super fire, can you blacklight them to tell pattern like you can with, uh, you know, ball pythons that are, uh, uh, you, that are you bells? Know, I, I remember Jeremy mentioning something about that years ago, probably in like 15, 16 um, I've never personally done it because I honestly just didn't care to. Um, my main focus was making the absolute best fires I right. could. The whites are just kind of ancillary to me. So, like, whatever the white has behind it, I, I wasn't really too concerned. Of course, when I make, like, say, like a Key West leucistic or something, I'll probably try just for my own personal... Yeah, no, it'd be cool to find out, yeah. I, I mean, but I, I guess there could be a, a possibility that that can happen because I have seen it with ball pythons. Right, but, totally. You know, with with the fire stuff, it, it's just like anything else. Like with, with pastel stuff or, or with any quality of animal, I mean, be it VPI or call albino or sharp or whatever, there's these huge ranges of quality. Now, again, let's, let's break it down a little bit. When I say quality, it's going to be independent upon the individual because there are some people who absolutely love the look of centrals, right? So they have central fires, which is cool because that's what they want. Me, I want that Colombian. I want a little bit of size. I want that base color, that clean pattern in the background. And, you know, I bred it into a lot of my pastel dream stock over here. And I bred it into Red Realm last year. So the idea is now I'm trying to infuse more color. Plus, I, I didn't want to focus on the whites because I've always kind of gone against the grain. I want to make my own path in essence. So I... I produce the Key West fires in 14, the Key Motley fires in 14. I've done Motley fire. I've done Jungle Motley fire. I've done Jungle fire. I've done Hypo fire. I've done just straight fire, pastel dream fire, uh, lots of different combinations. And the idea is now I could utilize that to take the project further in the future with the quality that, that I feel is good quality, you know. And I there are a lot of other animals out there that are beautiful, but, I mean nothing that I feel that I can't outdo myself. And, you know, I, I think that's where Diem has kind of really focused his energy when it comes to the pastelisms is for a long time, you know, us is coming up, you know, and Carlos, you too, coming into the hobby uh, and accumulating animals and buying stuff. We're just kind of like, oh yeah, that's cool. That's cool. This is cool. This is cool. Then you get to the refinement stage where you're like, all right, right. well, that was cool, but this one's cooler. I'm going to keep this one, let that one go. And then you're like, all right, well, now I want to start working with what I feel is the best representatives, and I want to start making my own, right, and carrying that quality throughout. And, I mean, some of the fires, like DM had said, is, to me, I wouldn't shake a stick at it just because it's not my thing, right? Like, central stuff, I have absolutely no no want to even own any of it, like, ever. But to someone else, I guess I guess you could see, you know, like, maybe they like it. Uh, I'm not going to judge him either way. You know, if their end game goal is white snakes, any type of fire to any type of fire will make white snakes. But if I take a white snake that I produce and I breed it to anything, every baby, every every baby, baby better come out banging because I know I use the best parents to do it. Yeah, you know? no, absolutely. And then one thing that I want to touch on uh, with uh, that you and DM also ended up covering is the fact that. Um, 
I think one of the signs of true advancement in the hobby as a keeper is not only how healthy your animals are, but essentially that you reach a point from that kind of maturity stage of let's call it like Pokemon syndrome, right? Where you just want one of each one of every type of morph, right? Yeah, and yeah. then eventually you get to, ooh, now I want just the best types of those morphs. To eventually, you get to the advanced stages, which is no, I want to produce the best examples of any of these potential morphs. So exactly. I think, I, I think that's really important. And and, and kind of what Dim's describing now is now is now Dim, he's getting into that place where not only do you want to produce the best type of those morphs, you want to go back to some to the base ingredients and say, I want to produce the absolute best base ingredients. And the only thing I could liken that to is to sushi, right? So I lived in Japan for a couple of years. And when I lived there, um, you go out to eat sushi there, especially if you have ever eaten sushi in the States, it's completely different. Over here, everybody's ordering rolls and all sorts of fancy crap. Over there, the best tasting and the best, ex- the most expensive sushi is the simplest, right? Because they focused on high, having the absolute highest quality ingredients you know something as simple as a piece of as a piece of bluefin on rice right over here in the states we would say yeah let's just go buy some bluefin you know at costco (laughs) or maybe if we're getting fancy go buy some bluefin at the at the at the fish market right and then we're going to throw it on some rice over there in japan they grade out every single piece of fish right they grade out all the individual cuts within that individual fish that they consider the best to extract what they are striving for being the absolute best cut of fish off of the best fish possible right and i think that's where dm where you're probably looking to go right uh essentially yeah yeah part of my thinking on that is if i can create normals or hypos or jungles or arabs or motleys that are cleaner, brighter, and more colorful than what the average is, then any of those animals would become more desirable to put into another incomplete dominant project or another recessive project because it's going to boost the genetic potential of that that project. Even if the animal that it's being placed to is not the, you know... At the same level, I would say, as the base morph that they're using, it's still going to create cleaner, brighter, and more colorful animals. The goal is that you want an animal that I produced to enhance another project you're already invested to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I think so that's my the hope pinnacle is of quality that... right there because it's one of those things to where that forces people if they see that quality in its base form and they want it, that means that you've really hit the nail on the head as far as producing a quality that is so different than what is currently available. People are ready to take that back to the basic form and even say, put it back into a recessive again, which means you're making a het and then you got to breed head to head, hopefully not the siblings. So you got to have at least two litters and breed back cousins at closest. And that, that, I mean, if you can force people to actually see that vision, which has been done with, especially with Ferrari recently, I'd say in like the last four years, a Ferrari has become very prominent in the fact of like, oh, I want to do call Ferrari. I want to do sharp Ferrari. One of the biggest ones that was done recently by Diem was the Ferrari head VPI. So now we have this lineage of Ferrari into VPI. Well, people could have just gone, okay, well, I'm going to just get a quote-unquote Pink Panther VPI. But then it's like, oh, wait, but look at the Ferrari in the base form. I'm going to take that to a VPI and make hets out of it, and then I'll eventually, four years down the road, if I'm lucky, be able to produce a visual Ferrari VPI. And it kind of, I mean, VPI's been around since, what, like 90, when was it, 98? Something yeah. Something like that long. Yeah, 96. Time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah 96. Yeah, it's been around since 96. And you have people now who are like, oh, well, let's go back to the very basic. And we're going to make heads again, but they're doing it with such a higher quality base animal. The end game product, which is the goal, is going to be that much better. Right. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Amy and Jen Helton because they are in on that project with me. 
and initially uh, the mail that was used is he's just a high color VPI he's not a a quote unquote pink panther if, if you give me time I'll go on a rant about that too later but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a really high colorful VPI and the I've bred him to two different females now the females were related to each other but he wasn't related to any of them and in both litters so the the initial female bred to is literally like the the best female ferrari that i've ever owned and she's from one of the original uh, litters with chris i paired him to her and the babies all came out super light super clean super pink and as you know time's gone on they've developed more pinks reds and oranges in fact there's one offspring that turned out almost completely orange uh, versus another one that turned out to be more red but then I bred him to another Ferrari who would be more technically considered Ferrari line than Pastel because she's got quite a bit of black on her. And while the offspring came out a bit dirtier, as would be expected given the breeding, they're still high color animals. But I would grade that litter a B versus the other litter, which I would grade as an A. They still have great genetic potential, but you got to put more work in on the grade B animal than you do on the grade A animal. The grade A, a animal is almost what they call plug and play, right? The grade B one's going to take more consideration because you're going to want to go ahead and clean up more of that to pull more of that color out. Because generally, the cleaner you make them, the more colorful they become as a byproduct of that. Kind of along that same line, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of your pet peeves, right? So one of the things that kind of always catches my eye whenever I like pull up your page is that uh, you have in quotes that Celestial Exotics has a no price match guarantee. So talk to me a little bit about that. So I used to to tell people I'm not fucking Walmart (laughs) because it would be one of those things where, and this is a really big pet peeve of mine with selective breeding because it comes down to... You have people who can appreciate it, people who are willing to learn about it, and people who can't appreciate it. And so oftentimes you'll end up with somebody who can appreciate it, and it'll be something along the lines of, well, uh, I'll use it for instance. I made some sugar uh, motley's poshead albino years ago. I had one for sale, and um, as far as motley's poshead albino went, he was probably about 35% more than what the average market price was. Uh, He was very clean. He was very bright. He was going to color up into a really nice adult. But I had somebody approach me and show me a picture of a regular run-of-the-mill, super dark, you know, motley, posh head albino. And the price difference, you know, like I said, it was about a 35% price difference. And basically telling me that I was going to have some great loss by them not purchasing that Motley from me because they were going to buy this one because it was cheaper unless I price matched it. So is, is that what you the, ended the up The only thing I it? have to say, well, the only thing I have to say to anybody who approaches a sale that way, that way is you're fucking doing it wrong. And that's not how you do it. But I explained to him that I wouldn't want him to purchase that animal anyway because he would never appreciate what that animal actually was and what actually went into that animal. Right. And so after having enough inquiries like this, I got got frustrated and I put that I'm not price matching because you cannot compare the average or the baseline of what's expected from any given mutation to one that crosses into an upper echelon where you spent or somebody spent four, six, eight, ten years trying to make this one animal. Preach. And it's not some combination of mutations and it's not, um, you know, just a simple recessive where it's head to head. You have to, to, to make a breeding and then you take the best example of that breeding and you put it to the best example of this other breeding and you take the best example of that one and you have to keep going on and on because you can't keep breeding them back together with uh, siblings or parents or anything like that because you're going to start seeing problems from the inbreeding. You have to be able to outcross. So you have to be able to actually find animals that are worthy of spending this amount of time with. But if you take 10 years to make an animal and a buyer's not going to appreciate you put the 10 years into the animal, 
that buyer shouldn't have that animal. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. And I don't think anybody should undercut their time, their effort, their blood, their sweat, and their tears. You know, consider your effort that goes into this. Like I say, boa breeding is an art. It's not a sport. It's not about who can get to the finish line first. You know, we're looking at animals that you want your buyer to be keeping. You don't want it to become a throwaway pet. So you have to put some type of value into your effort for these animals. Well, and I would I would say to add to that, there there's two other attributes that I would mention is you want like when you're purchasing an animal, right? And and say you were going to DM and you see something that's 30% higher over said animal from so and so. I love that because people have done that to me for years too. Is I always tell people is like you're buying the breeder as much as you are buying the animal. Yep. And when I say you're buying the breeder, you're buying their expertise, you're buying their care, their quality of lineage. Sometimes their you're facts. buying their whorish hands. Yeah, yeah, their whorish hands. Their their <laughs> respect. You know, I mean, like if if I say to people because I get messaged almost on a daily basis when I post VPI snow stuff, and they're like whoa, that VPS snow's nice. Where'd it come from? I was like, this is Kyle Frost lineage. Everybody knows Kyle Frost lineage snow stuff because it's Kyle Frost, right? So when you come to me and you say, okay, well, why is this snow $800 cheaper? And then they show me a picture. I was like, hold on, let me go get you a picture of my annery. And I send them an annery and it looks almost like their VPI snow, you know, and I'm not dogging on their snow. Cool, man, that's great. Like, go get your VPI snow. But I'm not going to sell you mine for two thousand bucks. Like, don't try and undercut me. It, it's if you want one for two grand, you can go find one for two grand. Oh. But when you're paying that premium as well, you're going to get me back in it first off. You're going to get my expertise, my lineage, my history, and my word, which has value to me. So if you're going to spend that premium, I'm going to do my best to take care of you and make you feel important. I don't count every single penny that comes in from every single person, and I don't squeeze them like radishes trying to get blood. You know, I'm like, here's a fair value. This is what I want for the animal, but what you get with it is not just the animal. And I think people lose sight. They're looking for that. Oh, I see it all the time. Like, where can I get the cheapest this? And it's like, bro, if you're going to get the cheapest this, you should have a really low expectation, right? When you're buying from somebody, you should have a high expectation of not only what you're getting, but the individual that you're buying from. There is a standard, right? And that's why, you know, I think that a lot of people lose sight in the end game is you might spend a little more, but on the back end, as far as care, conversation, advice, breeding help, things like that, that all comes down the pipeline when you're ready and to do that. Whereas if you buy it from some random shop online, What's your expectation? They're not going to help you because you're just another customer. Yep. You know, and then, you know, secondarily, I forgot what that point was. If I think about it, I'll, I'll drop that too. But, you know, I, the premium to me, when I look at animals from the people who like, like Diem, who specialize very specific into a certain genre and has the experience to say, this is why. I think the premiums are then justified. Not only is there the lineage, but there's the expertise and then that help on that back end. Like, I don't think people understand that help on the back end, that quote unquote mentorship, that has value. And time is money too. Like, if DM's going to spend an hour a day coaching people and helping people, could have just spent that hour a day working or cleaning or doing something to, you know, other than helping somebody. So if you have that expectation of like hitting up somebody, oh, hey, you know, I'm having humidity troubles. What humidifier do you use? If you've done business with them in the past, or even if you formed a relationship, they'll give you that information. You know, like I help people every day that I have no inclination or want ever to like them send me money. Like I'll help you absolutely you buy a bow or not. And I think that that's the whole idea is like we come together as a hobby, right? The set like like people first, money second, and when you pay that premium you better damn well also get that back end care. And you know, people had done it like Kyle, you know, he, he's my go to like, he's the only person I buy from these days, literally for all like, I haven't bought a bow in two and a half years. It's crazy. And, and I mean, for the longest time, I was like buying shit like crazy. And now it's like, you know, I can always go back and be like, Hey, what's this? What's that? Like, you know, he takes me into his house and he shows me his stuff and he lets me hold the snakes like the 
parents to my animals that I own now. You know, that's the type of thing that I, I appreciate the most is like when people take the time beyond the money, that back end care, that it's worth the premium every single time, literally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and, um, I do I do tell people that I offer lifetime customer service. But I also, I do expos. Well, I did expos. Nobody does expos right now. <laughs> um, I did expos out here, and I have a pamphlet that I put on my tables that has, it's a care sheet, as well as websites to find caging, useful forums, things like that. And I always give those out to people, even when... I know that at that moment they're not going to be making a purchase because I would rather that people who don't give me money have the right information for whoever they do eventually give the right money or give their money to because at the end of the day they're going to be taking care of an animal and I feel that it's my partly my responsibility as a keeper as a breeder as someone who loves these animals to educate other people who will potentially have them whether or not they spend their money with me because it's in the best interest of the animals and that's Absolutely. that's where a lot of people get lost these days is they forget that yeah no that that's totally true now let me ask you about another one of you guys pet peeves and that is the importance of accurately representing your animals when you sell them right mm. the pink panther let's start there <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, it, poor it, Pink Panther. It was a lineage that has held a lot of provenance uh, through a lot of the history of the morph itself. Um, unfortunately, much of it has been destroyed or watered down due to people expeditiously breeding for the purpose of just mass production. Well, There's this, no, be, this, this goes back to the, the issue of producing for the sake of producing, and that's what happened. And also the issue of calling every single thing from the breeding by that damn title. Yes, yes. And that, that, a lot of that is just a misunderstanding of how polygenics work. Just because an animal is born from a polygenic pastelism base animal does not mean that it is representative of the namesake. Meaning, again, I'll repeat it because I said this earlier. If you have a pink panther animal and you breed it to something, every single baby is not pink panther. I mean, if you look at an animal and it's gray, it has no pink. How could it, it's a gray panther. It's not a pink panther. So why are we calling it a pink panther? So the reason being is money. If you can attribute a name to, you know, that is, that is held to a high provenance lineage wise, to an animal that doesn't necessarily represent it. Okay, well, I can get an extra 400 bucks if I call it a pink panther, you know, arbitrary numbers. I'll get an extra 400 bucks, but if I do that to 100 animals, that's a significant amount of money, right? But now everyone who buys those thinks that they then have that namesake, and then when they produce, it perpetuates and perpetuates, and it's just a waterfall of shit that then ends up diluting the quality of that namesake. And we've seen it time and again with a multitude of animals where people have taken it. A, and, and Carlos and I have talked about this, I think is maybe with Sergio, where a person will afford a very high end singular animal, be it the male or female, and then they get a poor quality counterpart and they, in essence, polish a turd with it. And so they reduce. So, yeah, they made the lesser quality animal nicer, but they reduce the quality of that higher end animal. The pink panther and there are still pink panthers out there that, that have even red rum has pink panther lineage in it. You know, the, the very first red rum litter that was produced was from the red rum matriarch to a pink panther VPI making hot sauce and his sisters, which are the red rum head VPI. So there's pink panther in there coupled with the red rum. You know, there are still really high quality lineages out there. But overall, very, very few can really hold up to the namesake. And I am always disappointed when I see people call something that it's not. And I've seen it with every single type of pastelism that's out there, be it Pink Panther or Red Rum or Ferrari or EBV or Summit or whatever the hell line you want to say. They, they call it that for the specific reason of a monetary gain over just like a wild type version right so people are, it, people are like losing i'm sorry i don't mean to cut you off no yeah no yeah cut, cut me off the 
you're you're being much more polite about it than I feel like being right now. Yeah, and there's no reason to be polite about it because so it's here's, absolute bullshit. So here's my thing about it is, is people are getting lost in the goddamn name of it, right? So for starters, just so anybody who's listening who is unaware knows, there are it, the definition of pastelism is very very simple, which was coined by the Boa file himself, and it is a reduction in black. An overall stonewash coloration, missing or uh, severely reduced side medallions. There's not much more to it than that. Pastels can show up in any pairing whatsoever. It doesn't have to have a name to it as long as they follow those characteristics. Now, color, as one of my great mentors often said, color does not a pastel make. So color in and of itself doesn't mean anything. I see a lot of animals that are high color that are being sold as pastels that are really, really dirty, full of black. The side medallions are as bold as on any other animal. And that's not what the definition of it is disagree with the definition all you want that's what it's called now the increase of color is a byproduct of breeding for these characteristics because these characteristics that we're looking for ultimately have a severe reduction in yellow and the less re- yellow you have the more you red you get in facts theory. this yep. is how we're going off of this right <clears throat> but what pisses me off is when and it, it, you know, it'll be something like I've seen people shove like four or five pastel lines together and then they're naming off all these damn different pastels and the animals themselves are unremarkable. They, they're not, they're not deserving of, of all those names together, but just cause you shoved all these names together doesn't mean you're going to create something amazing. You still forgot the simplest thing when you strip away the titles when you strip away the egos when you strip away all the other bullshit that is known to happen in the color enhancement side of this industry what you're looking at is you're looking for the best example of what those characteristics defined were and the color that it does have or the color that it can bring if you're worried about anything else with the selective breeding for color you're doing it wrong but in all of my pastel litters that I've had, and I've had many of them over the years, there's a huge variation in pricing. I've had some where it started at 175 and it went all the way up to 700 and something, and this was for hypos and normals. And it's because there are lower-end animals in there, there are animals that are not worthy of the name, but they still have genetic potential if somebody wants to put the extra generational work into it. It's not as simple then, as taking me... the best example. I'm with you 100% of the way, because like, and I'll tell you myself, there is there's times that i have paid an absolute premium and other breeders have have called me foolish so for example i picked up a summit pastel vpi okay off of james rubio i paid over i think i paid 1500 bucks for it right which for just a summit pastel that's just a hat at a time where het vpis were really that expensive everybody thought i was crazy but the thing is that animal was the best particular example of a summit pastel I had ever seen, and it was worth every fucking penny. Exactly. I am more happy to pay for something like that than to then pay, you know, five hundred bucks for an average summit pastel at VPI. You know what I'm saying? I'll pay. Oh, I'll, no, no, I'll pay that hundred fifty percent premium. Premium, you I know, any day I of the week. Remember which litter it was and i'm not by any means discounting the litter it was a nice litter but i had seen a labyrinth litter somebody had produced where the uh, normals from it really weren't what you would expect from the lineage on one side of the parent so on the other you have to assume because i believe the other parent was a hypo um that the hypo they spent time on you know, looking at the hypos and the colorful, you know, making them the most colorful and everything like that. But the normals that came out of it weren't great. And that's one of those things that could easily hide in a mutation like Labyrinth or Scoria, where the entire pattern for the animal is reduced and the coloration is all whacked out and everything like that, is you need to know what the non-visual offspring looked like to have an idea of what you want to do with that animal. But then you get... I'm sorry, if you got a pink panther and it don't have a damn pink scale on it, it's not a pink it's panther. It's not pink panther. Yep. If you yeah. have a red rum and it doesn't have any red, 
it's not a red rum. It's right. literally in the name. It's really not that hard. <laughs> you know, I can understand being confused by, I don't know, let's say sugar because, well, sugar's white. That's a little bizarre. Or it could be brown. It's obviously not the color you want them to come out to be. That's obviously me being facetious, kids. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if the, if the color is in the name and it doesn't have the color, how the hell can you call it that? There's nothing wrong with calling something Pink Panther Line or Ferrari Line or Summit Line or Pastel Dream Line. Like, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is selling an upper echelon animal for like $600 or whatever and then selling its crappy looking offspring for the same damn price and convincing people that it's going to turn out the same way like that's fucked or, e- or even worse discounting it like say they are putting it up for 600 bucks and the shitty ones that are clearly not carrying that polygenic trait then saying oh yeah that one's $50 off because it's not as nice <laughs> that's almost that's insulting good. to that point you know what I mean I mean but, like but, unfortunately it's it's bait to catch inexperienced people, in my opinion, that unscrupulous breeders are using. I think it's that, but I also think it's a general misunderstanding of polygenic traits. Like that, I mean, we're, we work in an industry where incomplete dominance and uh, co-dominance are definitions to be argued as being synonymous, and they're not. Well, it, well also, het jungle. I mean, it's not right. heterozygous, right? I mean, het jungle, like... Het Motley, like, I mean, those well, don't exist. Come on, super is a uh, scientific term. Yeah, hell yeah, dude, Darwin that's came how up with they that. describe For capes. those types of traits. He's like, this, no is capes. A super Dar- this is a super Darwin finch, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, hey, Dan, let me ask you, um, kind of getting back to... Uh, some of the lessons that you've learned over the years uh, since you have been around for quite a while. Give me some of the important lessons that you learned within this hobby that you think is important for kind of new people coming into the hobby to understand. I don't care if Jesus himself sold you the boa, quarantine the damn thing. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Um, yep. Always find the best example of whatever it is you're going for if you're going to be breeding. If you're just looking for a pet, buy whatever the hell you know you want, but Go for what you like. Don't put your energy and your passion into genetics that you're not really into. If your goal is to just produce for the sake of producing, you're going to burn out. It's just the way it works. And at the end of the day, these animals deserve better than that anyway. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it was was kind of harkening back to, I think, the first interview we even did, the very first podcast, Carlos, is work with what you love because – if you do that, you can make it through the ups and downs of what boa breeding is. It, you, you could still wake up every day and be like, hey, I still love what I'm doing, even when it's hard. And, you know, we've all been there. There are a lot of hard times. And, you know, coming through that, if you're not working with things that you don't like, it's that much harder to keep going. Absolutely. So, Dan, in your opinion, where's the future of the hobby? Where, where do you think the hobby's moving to? Or, and where would you like it to move towards? I think that in general, um, I mean, and this is really hard to speculate on with everything that's going on in the world right now, because obviously the industry and the the economy are things that operate with each other, right? Which, you know, it's a unique industry in that the hobby side of it and the industry side of it don't really have a definitive line between the two. And I think that it's just as healthy and viable as it's ever been it's just a matter of people really producing what they love but producing for their passion and for the betterment of this species and not producing for the sake of producing i think that there's a lot more there's more exciting things going on you know i love the labyrinths i still love the scorias um i like seeing more people branching out with fire and not only chasing the whites uh, obviously, the pied boa, which, you know, that argument, is it a pied, is it a leopard, is it a leopard pied, all of that. Right. Hopefully, we'll have some answers for that soon, I'm assuming. Um, but I think overall, the future is bright. I, I really do. I don't see a reason to think negatively. I, I've, I've, I've run into a lot of people lately that have a bit of a pessimistic view, but I think that's more of a symptom of what's going on outside of the industry more than what's going on inside of it, personally. Yeah, no, totally. Awesome. All right, guys. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and take a break, and then when we come back, 
We're going to talk about dealing with setbacks in your collection. All right, guys, we're back. So one of the things uh, that I wanted to cover is uh, dealing with setbacks in your collection. So it seems that right now, uh, when you talk to a lot of experienced breeders, the measure of success in the bow industry is not only being able to produce really top-notch animals, but also having the resilience to push through when things aren't going according to the plan. The reality is that we're dealing with live animals, and they don't give a damn about what your investment quote unquote is on them right the animals need to be fed and they need to be kept healthy but we all know that we're dealing with live animals so there's going to be times where animals refuse to breed they can get sick and obviously they can die therefore resilience is a key uh, component to really being successful in this industry so Dan, one of the things that i wanted to ask you is why is having resilience a key differentiator in success in the industry I think resilience in every aspect of life is very important. And when you're talking about specializing in a hobby or a given industry that you're dedicated to, you're going to face setbacks. With live animals, it's even more guaranteed. Just like with people, they can become ill, they can die suddenly, they can suffer from a variety of problems, or, you know, you can encounter problems the last few years of my life have not been kind to me in regards to boas and i probably at this time two years ago had about 450 animals and now i think i have about 200 or so a lot of my animals over the past couple of years have uh been sold or traded for me to scale down however unfortunately I made a mistake a really really stupid mistake and I had gotten a group of of boas in that ended up having mites Mm -hmm. now at this time it had been seven or eight years since I had ever brought anything in and not quarantined it from my general collection and there were some problems going on at home we had just moved up here into washington and we were trying to settle down and so i made the decision that the animals were just going to be placed on the furthest side of my facility away from everybody else and then that was gonna suffice and i knew it was not right i knew it was the wrong thing to do i knew that if anybody had ever asked me their opinion on it i would have told them absolutely do not do that The only thing I can think of is it was a little bit of arrogance. It was, um, at this point, I would say that with boas, I often felt like I was bulletproof. Yeah, totally. And that is probably one of the greatest fallacies, right? And so within a couple of weeks of moving them in there, I think actually I had just come back from helping uh, Tom while he was out of country. Uh, helping with uh, his animals and I had gone to go check on everyone and I had a system in my facility at the time where I would check everybody based on their racks and where they were and the last one that I that I would look at would be the one that was you know supposed to be in quarantine and there was a considerable amount of animals in the racks and I opened one of the tubs and I saw them so I started uh, I started with treatment of them, obviously. It's right. the first thing you do when you see mites. I contacted the guy who had shipped them to me. It, it ended up that it was a really horrible situation of events that caused it to happen, and it was not their intention. Well, I don't and think it's ever anyone's intention. No, but... I don't think so either. And they paid for treatment and a few other they paid for my facility rent for for a little bit and i was grateful for that um but the mites i assume had probably been multi-generational at some point because permethrin and you know permethrin they they weren't killing them yeah yeah 
um, the normal dilution that everybody used was not enough. So I had to um, try different methods. And the facility that I was renting out, it was a section of a building. So it was basically a series of rooms that were set up inside of this building, and I rented one of these rooms out. It was like 20 by 30 or something. Right, right. And I made a mistake in that I had never considered that there was really only a singular ventilation point in that room, and there were no windows. Mm -hmm. Um, The way I was regulating lighting in the room was on a timer for the entire room, and I was humidifying the entire room. And I, I hate to admit to it, but I put some no pest strips in the room. Right. And I then proceeded to spend sometimes 16 hours out of a day in that room with those pest strips in there. And after a few weeks, I started getting nosebleeds a lot. I started getting headaches a lot. I was dealing with gastrointestinal issues. And around the same time, I started having problems with animals. They were passing urates that were like a blue-green color, which is generally an indicator of renal failure. Right. They were refusing to eat. They, I never saw anybody exhibit neurological symptoms, but there was a lot of gastrointestinal systems that, uh, uh, issues that were happening. And then next thing I knew, a female that I have that was gravid with a bunch of red rums rolled. And she had passed some of the weird looking urates. And so it ended up that this one section of the room, which was like the furthest corner of the room away from where the one spot of ventilation was, I was having all these problems. And it was anything from neonates to adults. It wasn't one experienced it over the other. Right. Yeah, no, and, no, no discrimination when you're talking no pest no. strip, you know, right. there, no. it, it doesn't care. And so it was a, around that time that I had gone to the doctor and it was their belief that I had basically pesticide overexposure and that's why I was having the problems I was having. So then it clicked in my head, oh my God, it has to be the pest strips, which yeah. did finally kill the mites, you know, um, so I removed them all from the room, but at that point, a lot, you know, what damage had been done had been done, and it, it got to a point, man, where I was coming in every day and finding one or two other animals that had rolled, and I got ne- necropsies done on some of them, and, you know, there were um, renal issues evident in, in three of them. One of them was inconclusive, but we had blood panels drawn, things like that. To, to see what was going on and ultimately I lost well over probably a hundred animals. Fuck. Oh to, God, to that's fucking heart wrenching. And then and and, and, and and coupled with that, not only did DM lose these animals, but you know, the co op pairing we did, the female rolled. Yeah. DM had yeah, to pretty was... much halt breeding. For like two years, two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so, so you know, a lot of people don't know. Like DM says, facility. It's actually a rented, standalone facility, as DM described, inside of a building, right? And rents come regardless. Of so, course, yeah. At this time, being diligent, being professional, DM was not sending animals to people. Halted all sales. Yep. And. So where where was this money supposed to come from? It's absorbed by the keeper. So this is something that I think people listening to and people wanting to come up in the hobby need to think about. When you have these types of circumstances or these extenuated circumstances, how like it it requires a fallback. This was not free, right? This cost an immense amount of money. I mean, if if we calculate litter cost, animal cost, consignment cost, care costs, health cost to DM himself. You can't almost even put a number on that. Because right. I remember DM, mes- DM messaged me and DM, he was like, dude, something's wrong with me. You know, I'm having these GI, GI issues. My mom's a gastroenterologist. So naturally it's like, hey, I'm going to hit up Tom, talk to his mom. 
because you know they're close and we we're trying to find out what could be going on okay i'm having these chronic headaches nosebleeds i mean him literally could have killed himself because of that no pest strip trying to get rid of these mites which harkens back to the idea of that inner voice he just didn't listen to when it comes to the quarantine which harkens back to the advice to the newcomers of quarantine and, that, and know, even if it's jesus yourself that circles back to the animals don't care what's going on in your life yeah biology uh, is fickle it literally yeah, gives w- no fucks Right. I was not in a good place. Like, you know, I actually went through some domestic abuse issues for a couple of years and um, it just was not possible. I, I didn't push enough to keep the animals at my house like I should have to do a proper quarantine for them. And to this day, I regret that decision probably more than I regret anything in Boas. And it's the reason why my business is scaling back down to basically being a hobby (laughs) because the amount of loss I've suffered over the last few years, I mean, not long after the mite problem really kind of shut me down like twice now since uh, all that happened, I had herp stats fail. Yep. I'm with you. I'm I'm on the same group. I had uh, 30, 30 animals killed in one incident. And I had about 19 killed in another. Yep. And resiliency at this point to some people would probably seem useless. And like, why would you even continue at this point? But this comes back to what the my love of these animals are. And for the animals who I still have, you know, the vision that I had for them, I still have. There's, there's not, there's barely anyone in this world that I would trust with my vision and I want to continue my vision, but it, it is hard at times, sometimes looking at them and thinking about what I've lost. I mean, animals who cannot be replaced, animals that were definitely one of a kind of what they were, you know, or took X amount of years to make. Um, in that time with the thir- the, the thermostat failures and, and with the dichlor, um, the, pest, the no pest strip incident, I also ended up feeding a bag of 25 mice to a rack of 25 animals, and they all were either sugar uh, Ferraris or Ferrari had VPI. Something was wrong with the bag of mice. All of them regurgitated, and I lost probably about half of the <sighs> sugar Ferrari litter to it. Yeah, every I think it was every single hypo, too. You know, yeah. almost. So the only... It was almost. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I, I'm, I'm with I've you. thought about quitting, don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I've thought really hard about it. Tom's Tom's heard it all from me. Um, well, I, th- I think out of out of anybody, just because of our relationship, I probably know more innate detail than anybody. And, you know, boas and not boas. And because of that, you know, I've always been kind of the devil on DM's shoulder saying, like, You know, either buck up, do this, do that. And eventually, you you know, initially, I'm like, all right, well, you know, keep your head up. And then eventually it was like, you need to fucking do something. And so it went for me kind of, I wasn't, I I don't want to say I was tiptoeing, you know, because I'm very blunt, especially with people I care about, right? And I mean, people that I consider family, in essence. I'm I'm not going to sugarcoat shit. But I eventually got to a point where I'm, I mean favorite phrase to you dm during that whole time was shit or get off the pot so you know cu- coupled with everything that was going on at that time there was an immense amount of stress put on dm and an immense amount of responsibility that he couldn't share with anybody because believe it or not it's like a one-man show like yeah totally very few times was there help there to be like okay let's treat this animal let's do this let's do that you know and then you got to deal with all the stuff at home. But when you come back to the brass tacks, the animals do not give a shit. They don't give a shit if you're about to have a baby. They don't give a shit if you got in a car accident. They don't give a shit if you have abusive situations. They they require your care, right? And there were times when DM was struggling with, can I keep this up? Can I do it? And, you know, I've scaled back three times since 2012. And... One of those times was burnout, 
the other right. two times was dependent upon, okay, well, I got to go overseas for two months because we're going to have my baby. My mom was taking care of the collection at the time. Yeah, she can't I remember. Handle that. Yep. Right? So I think now Diem, going through that entire onslaught of bullshit the past two and a half, three years, uh, regardless of any any you know emotional support, friendship support, moral support, has finally made that decision to do what is going to be best for not only the animals, but for Diem. And I think that that's a big realization when people are getting in this hobby. You need to know when to take a step back. It doesn't mean you're weak. doesn't mean you suck. doesn't mean that you fucked up beyond repair. It means that you need to be honest with what you can accomplish at this time. And the, the end game is you do not want to be so prideful and have such a big ego that your animals end up suffering because you just can't let go, right? And I had to do it. I did it my first year, I think, was 2015. And I did it, well, I guess I've done it twice where I did like a real large scale back. I did it in 15, then I did it in 17. And I actually almost sold my entire collection in 2017, every single animal and rack. The deal was mm -hmm. really close to being done. I almost did. Thank God I didn't because it was actually my, one of my best production years ever. You know, thanks for backing out, by the way. You know, shout out. But, um, you know, it, it really comes down to we're human. And because we're human, we make mistakes. You have to accept those mistakes. Look back at it. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. There's a bunch of shit all three of us and everyone else in the hobby probably would do different if they had the opportunity. But you never fail. You just learn as long as you don't repeat the same mistakes. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the things that you guys are speaking to really – there's two big topics and or two big themes I'd like to kind of call out of there. And number one is that – if you're in this hobby long enough, eventually you start facing some level of setbacks. I think, yep. just like Dim, I've lost animals to thermostat malfunctions in the past, right? Uh, I know, Tom, you're aware, but there was a, a couple of years ago, maybe f four years ago, where I lost almost all my males in my collection because the yep. racks that I had my males in had a thermostat ma uh, malfunction. It essentially cooked them to the point that the that the plastic racks had melted completely on them onto them and i'm lucky i found them i it, it, it was just shit luck it was a weekend that i had gone out of town and i think it had happened on the sunday that i returned because when i got back to the house the smell was overpowering i got in there and had i been home a couple of hours later i think my house Probably could potentially burn down. down yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely so and and I think we've all gone through the through kind of those moments where we're like fuck I, I can't do this anymore I want to quit like this is bullshit I and the thing that I've come to learn is that every time I've talked to anybody else who I respect in this hobby including you guys okay they all have similar stories of issues arising animals I had they had invested tons of money in dying right fantastic litters that they had produced you know dying animals not breeding hell I'll, I'll give you i'll actually tell you the worst one that ever happened to me this was probably in 2012 i produced some like just a killer 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 um litter of sunglow jungle vpis right that were head anery. And this is when they were still, you know, significantly rare. Okay. Um, my daughter, who at the time was, you know, she's, so I think she was like 12. Okay. She, or no, she was 11. She noticed that the babies needed to be soaked. I asked her to pour a little bit of warm water into the tub. This is a couple of days after, after they had been born. Okay. She went in there, she poured a little tiny bit of water on the paper towels, and she didn't close the tub all the way. Following day, all the babies had gotten out. And unfortunately, there was some uh, sticky traps. Oh, no way. In oh, my no. house. Because we, had, we were living in Phoenix, and we had just moved down to the Phoenix area, and we had those four scorpions that were getting in the house, right? Mm-hmm. And... With the exception of two animals, the entire litter got caught on sticky traps and died. No. 
and we're talking about uh, like so i think the litter was like 18 animals dude and out of the out of the entire litter i i had had great odds i had hit 12 sun glow jungles jesus so i mean like right there at that time you know i basically ate about a fifty thousand dollar loss because of a yeah. mistake that i trusted to to an 11 year old who had by the way done that tons of times before you know what i mean my kids like tom's kids are have been raised it, it, within the hobby right and when they get get older they become a little bit more useful they've helped out and there's never been an issue like that it just happened it just took that one little tiny mistake that one little time and it was yeah. absolutely fucking heartbreaking. And at the time, I really needed to move those animals. A lot of those animals had actually been pre-sold because the day that they had been born, I had posted the pictures and immediately I had people jumping on me, putting deposits. You know what I mean? Yeah. First, uh, uh, shame uh, on you for doing that before they shed. Second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. Know, you know, you, well, you know what's the primary yeah. factor most of the time between success and failure, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Luck. Yeah, absolutely. Hundred well, percent. Well, well, so, well. So get this. And so it was my, it was a hard lesson. You know what I mean? Well, but yeah, my I mean, youngest that's, son. That's yeah. beyond I, a punch in the gut. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it was a hundred percent my fault. Like I couldn't blame my kid for it. You know what I mean? That's well, something yeah, that I should have done. It was a responsibility that you should have done. But that should have been on me. And the yeah. only person that I was upset with was me in that moment. You know. And like I said, the more I talk to people within the hobby, the more they have similar stories of mistakes they made when they were newer, mistakes they made when they got <laughs> cocky, like I did that time, right? Or yeah. simply just shit luck, and it happens, well, right? And it happens. Well, and, I, and so I think I think people need to really listen to what you just said about the circumstances and how they got out. That is not necessarily abnormal. So. I've mm -hmm. had multiple instances where I have had to leave the country um, for my kids or I was out of town. And during that time, I swear, every time I go out of town, I have litters drop. I swear to God, like I need a vacation. Non you get like fucking I'd... anxiety after a while yeah. when you go out well, during, I, I would, during I would have That's why he started Olympic. paying me to go out there and look at everything. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I literally would fly DM out to like take care of shit. So get yeah. this though, like I produced the, the Hypo Jungle Red Rum. Uh, head VPI fires this last year, right? In 2019. Well, I was in California when they dropped and my mom and dad are fairly adept after eight years in the hobby and my mom's lived with me that entire time uh, after her strokes. So they, they pull the animal or they pull the babies out and they set them up in a tub with water and substrate, you know, to begin the shedding process, yada, yada. And literally the day we're driving home, uh, we were at Disneyland and we were driving back and I get home and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm so excited to go here. And in the in the bird's eye view picture that they sent me initially, I was like, OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, I can count the entire litter. I open up the tub and there's like seven. And I'm like, uh, where the hell are all the babies? Mm. And get this, though, like at the time, I think I had 18 Freedom Breeder racks in there. Right. I had three, three, fifteen, seventy fives. Seven, seven level six foot, um, four or five zero eight twenty fours. You know that that are eight levels high, and I mean like a lot of heat panels, a lot of small spaces. I literally tore my room apart and didn't find them. And I'm oh, like, what the dude. hell's going on? So then I'm thinking to myself, like, Jesus, did someone break into the facility? Like, what the hell happened? You know, because yeah. that has happened in the past, and I happen to be out of town, and I never tell people when I'm going because I don't want something bad to happen. Yeah, but I was like. I mean, where else could they be? And then I start thinking, like, holy shit, dude, Freedom Breeder racks, like, each level, the legs are hollow, right? They're tubes. Yep. They're, they're yep. square tubes or whatever. And Literally looking shining. at one right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so I, I take a mag light and I shine. I set it on top of the rack and, like, like up at the top and I point it down to see if I could illuminate through the tube onto the ground below. And I'm like, okay, shows up, okay, shows up, okay, shows up. Oh, wait, holy shit, why is this one black? Why isn't literally every single one of the babies went Get into the fuck out of here? Oh a my singular God. tubular column, but we're talking like eight levels, right? So they've wedged themselves so hard into this thing. I have to disassemble this entire rack level by level. As I'm disassembling, 
some of the joints between the two legs are like an animal is on the one above it and the one below it, but they're so wedged in there that like if I pull it, I'm going to just pull the animal apart, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting like zip ties and trying to like tickle their bellies and get them to move just enough. I eventually got every single one of them out and got the litter back into the box and, you know, was then able to let them shut out. But the year prior to that, or no, two years in 2017, I was in Taiwan for the birth of my youngest. I'm going to and... preface this with, I am the best boa wrangler Tom's facilities ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so, so there's been a couple instances, but th this one, this one's not, not the one you're thinking of DM, but th that oh, was a bad. previous one, right? So this was the leucistic litter I had though. Um, when was this? Uh, oh, this was 2018 is when it was. So I, I was probably in California or Vegas and a leucistic litter dropped that I did. We got three leucistics and I think like nine fires in the litter. And of course, when you get a picture of this, you're like, okay, I can count three white snakes. Well, I get home, there's two in the box. And I'm like, fuck, not again, mom. Like, what the fuck is going on, dude? Like, where's the other leucistic? She's like, no, there was only two. Then I show her the picture and you can see one, two, three. And I'm like, okay, where's the other one? I had to tear the whole room apart. Year before that, when Charlie was born in 17, um, I had a Key West Fire Motley litter, or Key West Motley Fire, whatever you want to call it. And Diem actually ended up finding a baby that my mom had somehow lost again. Because, I see, I, that, I had to That entrust. nobody really knew was lost. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah no, no one even knew it existed. Like, it, like she was just going through my room, and... And my mom is like, I don't know where it is. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Well, like there could have been, it could, I don't know how many there were. I didn't count. And then DM hits me up. Like there's a 17 hour time difference messages me on Facebook. And he's like, Hey, guess what? I found the snake under a heat panel in your room. And I'm like, what? And, and <laughs> <laughs> sends me a picture of it. And it's like a full striped key motley fire. And I'm like, Oh sick. Like that's cool. But it was yet another, another one. Then another time DM, do you remember that one that, I had the live hoppers in the room. Remember that? Yes. And that yes. VPI that VPI Motley head annery got out and ate like seven hoppers in one meal. <laughs> Dude, D I DM found for the, the snake. Hoppers. The rest of them were like huddled in a corner like freaked the like, hell out. Like what the fuck just happened? <laughs> I found the snake oh, and it was just completely engorged. It's like the, yeah, it's like I a horror movie for those poor hoppers, man. Dude, it, it looked it literally looks like a bratwurst. Like you the could thing almost that... count the bodies that were in it. That's how Holy stuffed crap. this animal was. This, he and, was and, sure he was gonna gurge. This is first meal. This snake. Oh right? no! <laughs> I'm not oh, shitting you. Oh no! It, Holy! It, I, it, ha it had to have eaten six or seven hoppers. You know, because I had a box in there. It somehow got out at that time, and you know, and this was before I was using the like zero eight twenty four tubs to actually like house neonates i was using sterilites instead and if they don't click all the way down or whatever it would pop right and so it got out and then i go down there and we see we see it's gone and dm and i are like oh shit well we got to find it right so we start flipping panels and pulling tubs out and looking for it and we find this thing it literally looks like a bratwurst you're about to throw right your before barbecue. we found that i had made a joke that said i felt that there were less mice in the box than had been in there previously yeah, and then yeah, so I start it looking got in out there. And it had a buffet, like I had made a complete joke about it before we found it. And oh, and man. so you know we we ended up finding it, putting it back on a tub, and I mean it pooped out fine. It was actually the one I just posted on Bow Addicts today. It was oh, like, okay. that v, yeah. that VPI Motley head anery. It digested that all of those mice. Holy shit! Every, yep, perfect. Like perfect turds too. Like not gray, nothing like it. That was first meal, dude. That <laughs> that thing shed like six times before I fed it again. You know, oh, I, like God. I was like. No, not really, but yeah, I mean, this harkens back to like the the idea of shit happens. Like you yeah. cannot account for everything. Like there are circumstances, and when you're a keeper and you're keeping a, a larger collection or you're keeping a high end, uh, high end or low end, whatever. Like it's your responsibility to care for these animals, and as much as we would like to entrust their care to other people, the mean well, right? They mean well and they're trying their best. It doesn't always work out. And like in your situation, Carlos, you can't necessarily blame anybody but yourself because you probably knew on the back end, like, hey, well, I, I should have done it. And in my case, it was like, well, shit, I should have and could have done it. And so like this year, my wife's due in a week now. And with the COVID situation, obviously, we didn't plan to travel to Taiwan um, to have the birth of our daughter. 
So, but we had initially planned for that. And so I was setting my mom up like, hey, here's the to do, to do, to do. But I was going to fly back from Taiwan every two weeks to go Mm -hmm. through everybody and make sure everything. And that was going to be my big difference this time because uh, every other time I was like gone for a month and a half or two months. And, you know, I would just get sporadic updates and I would have to fly Diem down to kind of help raise the level of care while I was gone. Right. But yeah, I mean, shit happens, man. And, you know, loss is, is part of the hobby. I mean, talk to anyone who does live animal breeding of any kind, be it heifers, pigs, horses, snakes, tigers, dogs, yep. tortoises, dogs. I mean, hell, even some people do it with kids, you know, like the Duggars, they got like 20 or something now. Right, you know, right. it, it's, it's like shit eventually happens. The more you have, the longer you do it, the more chances that something is going to happen. People need to be really aware of that fact. And, you know, going back to the whole reason why that topic even started is that resilience is it's it's not what you do during the circumstance necessarily. It's how you pick yourself up from it. And Absolutely. And, and dude, sometimes- there's there's a second thing that I think we're we're all saying, but that we shouldn't necessarily underplay. And that's the fact that as tough as this hobby is, right? That you end up making some of the best friendships in this hobby. You feel when things go wrong and you kind of reach out to your like support well, network you, you within the hobby, out. you end up seeing that you're not alone, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and 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 you know, I I would think in the situation, you know, DM is probably uh, between DM and John Spencer, you know, their family at this point. I met them both through Snakes. Um, you know, with the situation with DM, with everything that had happened over the past three years, I mean, I wouldn't be lying if I said there were times when I want to absolutely strangle him, honestly. Yeah. And that, like, I was getting so pissed off to the point where I'm like, shit or get off the pot. Like, you need to fucking do something. I said, you can move here. We'll figure it out. I don't care what we got to do. Let's do something. But the thing is, is DM had to find his own way to wade through the bullshit, you know, totally. and took, took immense amounts of steps to do so. Um, I think because of our level of friendship and, in essence, our family friendship or you know our family relationship yeah where it was difficult for Diem to come to a head and be like hey something is really like i can't even remember how long it took for us to finally have like a brass tasks conversation of what was going on not only in the house but with the animals because when bad shit's happening you sometimes just don't want to face it because it's harder uh, it's to face it than it is to forget about, about it after after everything really <clears throat> kind of came to a head for me and you know I've thought about quitting. I've thought about selling everything. I've thought about giving up on it. And and the thing that I'll tell people is there is a time to leave it and there's a time to go back to it. And I would say that if you feel any true passion still, if you still feel, you know, if you open up a tub and you still feel the same way when you look at an animal as you did when it took its first breath, you know what I mean? Like, you need to keep that. That's what Like, you if you still have that dream... Going. Yeah, yeah, if you still have that dream, like when you're looking at it, long-term goal, you can have short-term setbacks that can affect your outcome in time, but you still have the opportunity to chase that long-term goal. And, you know, monetarily comes down to that. Time comes down to that. Your passion comes down to that. Life circumstance comes down to that. If you can still at the, you know, like what Dean just said, look back and be like, I still see this as potential. You're not ready to throw in the towel. That doesn't right. mean that you don't scale back. It doesn't mean that you don't take a step back and reset, right? I've reset a couple times in my collection. Dean's resetting right now. And, you know, you forcibly or not had to reset as well, Carlos. Yep. You know, people people reset, people refine, people have circumstances that take time away that cause things or this or that or the other or, you know, horrible circumstances like glue traps or pesticide overdose or or whatever. Like there's a multitude of issues. But if you can surround yourself with the right people that'll tell you the real shit and not just sit there and tell you what you want to hear, but also kind of look in the mirror yourself and be like, you still got to believe in yourself. I mean, you can never be successful if you sit there and just think all you do is fuck up and fail. People fuck up and fail, you know? But 
is you know the quote I like is like you don't fail you learn you only fail if you repeat the same shit expecting a different different outcome yep you know that's the only truth so do something different you know having that resilience especially in live animal breeding I mean it's some people are innate like they got it you know other people that's why we see so many people come in hard and they leave real quick because in the end it just isn't for them you know they they don't have that live animal breeding resilience that you're you require to carry on in this industry, whether you're having the best luck in the world or the worst, like you still got to have it, you know? Yeah, no, totally. So guys, um, I'm going to pivot now and let's talk a little bit about pastel boas. Um, so if you talk to a lot of people who are really deep into this hobby and you ask them what their favorite lines of pastel, I think a significant portion of these folks would definitely start talking about uh, the fact that their favorite or what they consider the highest quality of the line of pastel tends to be the Ferrari pastel. Um, so DM, I want you to give me a little bit of background of the Ferrari pastel and kind of the sugar pastel and why you chose to work with it. The uh, sugar pastel one's kind of funny because that one was kind of <clears throat> more or less thrust upon me and I wasn't actually initially interested in working with it, but I was still kind of immature in my understanding of selective breeding and what the true potential of pastel is or can be. Um, but the Ferraris, oh man, and you're testing my history here for a minute. They, as they I said, started, started from the by, TC uh, pastel. Yeah, right. The <laughs> Chris Canada Smith was the one who founded that line. Um, interestingly enough, he did not particularly name the line. Uh, which is actually similar to Sugar, and I'll explain that one too. But actually, um, Chris had gotten uh, the original ma uh, Ferrari male uh, with a couple of other really nice pastels at the time, one of which it eventually founded what was his uh, CCS pastel, I believe. He'll correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. But a friend of his had come over to look at all of the animals and he had looked at all the pastels he had gotten and he was like, okay, you see all of these, these are BMWs. He's like, but that one, and he pointed at the male who would eventually be known as the Ferrari male. He said, that one right there is a Ferrari. And so that was the one that Chris took to uh, start his line. And he originally paired it to a, um, Ooh, I'm trying to remember the name of the breeder. It's terrible that I can't remember. She was an orange tail hypo. She was gorgeous. Um, but she was a Dale Specken uh, hypo. And he bred those two together in 2009, produced the first litter of uh, what would be known as Ferraris. And really what it was kind of down to is people would say that they wanted, you know, one of the one of the Ferraris, which, you know, one of the Ferrari males offspring. So that kind of stuck. <clears throat> and so Chris kind of went with it. And so then he had another litter of them in 2011. Um, after that, the project kind of turned over to me and I had gotten the, uh, original Ferrari dam. I did not get the original Ferrari male. Um, he died suddenly of a, uh, illness that he was quite, he was hiding quite well. Um, but I ended up producing my first litter of Ferraris, um, after several attempts that did not work out for me, but I produced my first litter of them in, I want to say 2015. I could be wrong about that. I'd have to go back and look, but it was a project that had actually given me quite a bit of heartache. But my thing about the Ferraris that I had loved was they have this glow to them. And that's really the only way to describe it. You look at them and it's it's just this glow. They're so vibrant and they're so clean. And in the beginning when they're born, they're generally not as um, saturated as some other pastel lines you'll see. However, they age very much like a fine wine. And from neonate to adult they undergo extreme color changes many of the adults that i have are very much still red or orange or very very pink there is a pretty high variation in them but i fell in love with them because you know pretty much everything that they that you know i put them to or that you know i saw them get put to they just improved it 
And it was a line that I tried to give a lot of notoriety to because I was very much in love with it, and I'm sure it was much to the annoyance of, <laughs> of other people, but that's all right. Um, the Sugars were started by uh, Mike and T of Jungle Struck. You'll have to forgive me because I do not remember their last name. And so the pairing was actually a male named Red Boy to a female named uh, Sugar Baby. Or Sugar, sorry, her name was Sugar. And so when that litter was produced, Sugar was actually a very classic pastel. She was not overly colorful. She was a beautiful, beautiful, clean golden color. And Red Boy, for obvious reasons, was named for the fact that he was quite red. But the offspring that came out were very red. Uh, almost all of them actually got the red from their father. And then, of course, the cleanliness of the mother and the lack of, um, you know darkness to her enhanced all of that and so people when they wanted the babies said that they would want one of sugar's babies they want sugar baby and things like that so the pastel line eventually actually became sugar baby but over time that's kind of fallen off and it's just known as sugar but the sugars are typically much deeper in color uh they're a little bit darker by nature also a much smaller line of boas that i've worked with they um They've done some really good things to Annery. I've bred them into Annery. I've put them into Motley's. Um, hopefully, I'll have some visual call albinos of them this season, if not next. I'm um, hoping to have a visual Ferrari VPI here pretty soon so we can see how those guys are going to develop. Admittedly, of the two litters, I've only sold maybe five of the babies, and I've kept the rest of them because I'm greedy. <laughs> um... But it's also to maintain my control on that project, too. I mean, I have no idea what a Ferrari VPIT positive is going to look like, you right. know what I'm saying. And I want to know that before I really start uh, letting more of those guys go. Let me ask you, uh, what, do you feel like this uh, project is, is yet fairly unexplored? I know we haven't seen a lot being done with it quite yet as far as VPI stuff. But do you think overall it's still you know, relatively new? I would say that, yes, it's relatively new. As far as I know, uh, myself and the Heltons were the first ones to make any of the hats to begin with. Um, I think that there is such an abundance of gorgeous and, and great to work with pastel lines that it's hard to... It kind of seems to go in waves, you know. Um, Red Rum is still very much a big thing and has been ever since it came onto the scene. Um, you're seeing more and more done with, uh, Summit these days as well, which is, is good because it's kind of getting a bit of a revival, I feel. Right, right, um, yeah. You know, Pastel Dream, uh, is also a big thing, but, like, you know, y you don't hear about VPI and Pastel Dream, typically. I mean, unless you want to split hairs and you go with the Chunku, but that's a yeah. subject for another day, I guess. Yep. Um... But when you refer to something like Key West, of course, like one of the first things you think about is Pastel Dream. So I think for Ferrari, for the most part now, what you think about is clean, colorful normals and especially clean, colorful hypos. But I'm trying to kind of change that narrative and get it to where people are going to want to. And it seems that they're starting to see that this is a great line to put into anything. And of course, VPI is as good as anything else to put it into since it's, you know, become such a much more affordable project for people and, and a lot more people are wanting to get into it. And a lot more people are wanting to go for those, those powerful, colorful VPIs. They're not wanting those dirty drab ones. Right. And they're seeing that, that the power of this line to, to potentially do that. That's awesome. All right, guys, so we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we are going to hit the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen. All right, guys, we are back, and it's time for the Dirty Dozen. Damn, I'm going to ask you 12 questions. You can be, give me 12 answers. They can be as long or as short as you want, okay? All right, that's fair. All right, number one, what's the size of your current collection? Uh, probably about 200. All right, number two, uh, husbandry-related question. Frozen, thawed, or live, and what's your betting choice? Um, I, I think that in most cases, boas will take frozen, thawed, so there's no reason to feed live. Doing pre-killed is fine, too, but I find it absolutely unnecessary in, like, 99.9% .9 of cases. 
Uh, betting choice, I've used a variety of things over the years. Um, one of the things I use, and I know I'm going to get some shit for this, but I use kiln dried pine. Uh, kiln dried pine. Sorry. Really? Yeah, uh, kiln dried is is the important part of it. Um, but I also use I've used aspen over the years. I love aspen, and I also like. Um, I don't know if it's the Repti chip. I think it's the one that's the coconut husk. Yeah, Repti chip. Yeah. I love. Yeah, I love coca husk bedding for boas. I think it's a great bedding choice for most species that could use higher humidity. Yeah, totally. My young boas love that stuff. All right. Yeah, I bet they burrow in it too. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, number three, what's your favorite morph or locality? Hmm. You know what? I gotta Red go with Scoria. I have to. I'm sorry. Score it. There you go. Yeah. All right. Number four. What is the most overrated morph in your opinion? IMG. Really? Wow. DM bucking yeah. the trend. Nice. I. You know, I've seen it do some cool things in combination, but in general, in most cases, you're going to get a black snake. So I don't – I think it's cool. I do. I would, I, I would like to have some, but as far as – gene stacking them i don't see a ton of point all right number five what is the most underrated morph i think the rdr annery could use a little more love oh yeah 100 percent. shout out to yeah. big mike and uh to chaz those guys are doing a lot of work with that stuff yeah especially yeah, with the specter boa wow yes, th that's that's I a killer combo mm -hmm. all right number six what is your favorite part of the hobby I think it's really cool that people of all ages, backgrounds of any kind, career paths can come together and share a, a, a mutual love for these animals and can form bonds with each other that might have not ever come about without it. No, that's awesome. Number seven, what's the worst part of the hobby for you? Well, what we've all been guilty of, the shit talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Uh, number eight. Um, do you keep any other species? And if not, is there any other species you would like to keep? Actually, I have uh, several other boa species. I have some rosy boas. I have some uh, rough-scaled sand boas. Um, I have some Kenyan sand boas. Um, my favorite's probably right now the Solomon Ground, uh, Solomon Island ground boa. Yeah. Um, I also have a Halmahera ground boa. Um, and I have some viper boas. Oh, mean little bastards, but they're cool looking. Uh, you know, actually, most, most of the ones I have are pretty chill. I do have a couple of the Solomons that are complete and utter dicks, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're definitely out there. Number nine, what's a common misconception about you? That I'm a woman. All right. Number ten, what makes you say, what was I thinking when you look back at your time in the hobby? Um, I mean, really, I think it comes back down to not quarantining and getting the worst case scenario out of that that I could have possibly gotten. So let me ask you something. Um, what's your, after everything that you've been through, what is your quarantining protocol? Um, at this point, it is two complete and utter separate locations from each other. Okay. For how long um, though? You know, that one's kind of difficult given what we've learned about certain issues that these animals can have and incubation periods and things like that. But I would say in general, um, nobody nobody goes under six months anymore. Right, right. It used to, I used to do neonates would be about three months, and then juveniles would be about six, and then adults would be a year. But uh, yeah, that's not the case anymore. Yeah. Well, well. And, now, and now, so now it's almost actually... like they're going to sit in quarantine until I absolutely need to move them. Really? Yeah, and that, okay. yeah. That that six that six months coincides with the zoological standard for quarantine in like a accredited zoological so, you know association. Uh, they when they're bringing new animals into their facilities, uh, let's say for instance like San Diego Zoo, they're going to have a quarantine procedure that stipulates a six month minimum quarantine period. Yeah. Uh, like DM DM mentioned with the incubation periods of certain things and so forth, that doesn't necessarily guarantee. But err on the side of caution. Like Jesus himself, I swear to God, if he came off that <laughs> cross and handed me a boa, that shit, he's going to first wash his hands, but put a glove on before he touches it and hands it to me. And then he's going to hand it to me and I'm going to quarantine it. So you, you got to. And 
you know, I don't care if anyone says, well, I'm your buddy, I'm your friend. It does not matter. Literally, I've like, quarantined don't Boas risk from it. Tom, just so y'all know. <laughs> yep. And, 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 and when I ship Boas out, I tell people, I'm like, please quarantine them. And they're like, you know, sometimes they'll come back and be like, oh, what's wrong with that? I was like, nothing's wrong with it. I want you to protect your animal as much as mine because I don't want to have them introduce an animal that I sent them and all of a sudden be afflicted with an issue that maybe they have that if they quarantine it, they won't, right? Right, so absolutely. It, it's it's just professional. Yep. All right, number 11. What's one tip you would give the people looking in best in boas and reptiles? You got to find something that you actually care about. And the, the, the goal, the care about can't be the money. You have to actually care about what you're working with. But also, spend time looking. Ask every question you can think of to the breeder. Any, any ethical or responsible breeder will answer every question you have, no matter how dumb it seems it may be. Um, and also make sure that, you know, that you're, you're investing in this. So you want to buy the best example of whatever it is that you're going for. Spend the money and take the extra time. Don't speed through it. This is a game of time. Those who try to rush through it or those who do not make it very long. Yeah, that's absolutely true. All right, number 12. Any shout-outs you want to throw out there besides Tom? <laughs> um, you know, I guess, I mean, there's really too many people to name. You know, shout-out to anybody who was there for me, you know, in the darker times when I was struggling to things. And, of course, shout-out shout out to Chris and Donnie and Michelle and – um. You know, shout out to all the boa people. Hell yeah. All Remember, right, guys. Boa breeding is an art, not a sport. That's right. Well, on that, guys, I think that wraps it up for today. Dim and Tom, tell the people out there where they can see your animals and learn more about you. Dim. Um, Celestial Exotics on Facebook, though I'm really bad about updating it. Honestly, if you just send me a friend request on Facebook, I'll probably accept it, and you can see what I post there. <laughs> awesome. And then Tom. All right, as always, uh, Facebook is under Boa Addicts, and as well, Instagram is at Boa Addicts. So you can, I update them fairly regularly. Uh, you could also PM me, uh, DM, whatever, and ask me anything you need. Awesome. And then me, guys, you can find me at Morphs Unleashed on Morph Market. Guys, that's it for today. We are out. Guys, that was a great episode. Thanks to Dian Bubade of Celestial Exotics for joining us today. Join us next time as we speak with Richard Field of All Star Constrictors. We're going to talk about his work with European pastel lines, his time in professional basketball, and he's going to give us some tips for importing boas. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Do us a favor. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Until next time, grow them slow. <laughs>